So my name is Kinyar Parham. I am the executive director of NRAPE on campus. Uh, for those of you who may not know, EROC works to end campus sexual assault by providing direct support for survivors in their communities, prevention through education and policy reform on the campus, local, state and federal levels. I want to thank you so much for joining us for our first week and final session of our, of our first week of our summit series with It's On Us. We hope that so far you've enjoyed the sessions um, and that they have been as knowledgeable and fruitful for you so far. We have a great deal more coming soon. Um, I'm also joined by my colleague who will introduce herself. Hi and welcome everyone. My name is Sylvia Zanteno, the Director of Educational Programs and Training here at It's On Us. Our mission is to build on the movement to combat campus sexual assault by engaging all students, um, including young men, and activating the largest student or organizing program of its kind in grassroots awareness and prevention education programs. Um, thank you all for being here. Please uh, make sure to check out our lineup for weeks two and three of this summit series. We have and continue to add some new and really amazing sessions. Um, so you can go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash in all caps, summit series 20 and uh, see for yourself. So please make sure to go register and you will start to receive both uh, the confirmation and follow-up emails on that. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, so today we are here to discuss Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campus with two amazing professors of Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Personally, I am so excited so excited for this particular session. Um, they are fabulous rock stars of just human beings. Um, and I'm just excited for the rest of you to also see how amazing they are. Um, but before we get started and introduce them, I also want to let you know that we have a promo code for 20% off of Sexual Citizens. Um, so if you go to bit.ly um, slash SCSS20, and enter SAVE20 in all caps as you check out, you'll be able to get that discount. And Sylvia provided that in the chat box as well. Um, and we'll be sure to send this in a follow-up email for you as well. Um, but before we dive into our conversation, Sylvia will provide you with more of a rundown of what to expect during this session and provide you a snapshot of what's to come for session two. Thanks so much, Kenyura. So today, uh, Kenyura and I will be interviewing the authors Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Sh Khan um, about their book, Sexual Citizens. It's a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campuses. Um, following the interview, the authors will lead you all in a short introduction and exercise with uh, some short homework assignments for session two, which will be happening at this time next week. Um, it will be on sexual geography and reimagining what your campus could look like with this new concept. Um, in the second session, for those who have um, joined us today, we will get to review what you have envisioned and have sort of a gallery session where you, are, where you will work and tell us what you have reimagined for your campus and what it could look like. Um, and we will also explain this um, in the latter half of the session. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I also want to add that during this interview, if at any point anyone feels triggered by um, any of the conversations that we're, ha we're having today with the authors or even within the chat box, um, we want to definitely let you all know that feel free to jump off um, the webinar step away, take a break, do whatever you need to do for your own self-care. Um, but um, definitely um, want to make sure that you know that because we are talking about sexual violence um, in this interview. Um, so please take care of yourselves. Um, so at this time, we're going to actually turn off the chat box where you'll only be able to share your questions with me specifically um, throughout the interview. 
Um, we also ask that you please remain um, having your video off during this time as well. Um, and yeah, so we're gonna get started. So let's introduce you to our special guests. So Jennifer Hirsch is a professor of social medical sciences at Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. Seamus Khan is a professor of sociology at Columbia. Together, they are authors of Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campus, published by W.W. W. Norton. That work was realized as part of Columbia's Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation, or SHIFT, co-directed by Jennifer and clinical psychologist Claude Ann Millens. Some of you may recall SHIFT profiled by Gia Tolento in The New Yorker in February of 2018. A recent review in Science describes sexual citizens as profoundly eye-opening, and we are delighted to welcome Jennifer and Seamus to our SHARE community for a conversation about campus sexual assault and what all of us can do to prevent it. Thanks for having us. We're delighted to be here. out the mute button on this virtual <laughs> Zoom. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and ask the first question to both of you. Um, so let's start with the big one. Why did you write this book? Um, I'll start with a story. So um, Austin, by the time he came in to share his story with us, um, was in many ways like a touching and engaging young man. He he told a story which I am not going to share tonight, which is um, uh, sort of the only like hot sex scene in the book. It's about a, a an evening with him and his girlfriend. Um, it was the Fourth of July. They ended up making their own fireworks. I will leave the rest to your imagination. Um, he he cared about being a good lover. He had developed a series of nicknames for the kinds of orgasms that his girlfriend had. Um, and so he really wanted to show up with, show up for her as a, as a lover and as a human. And yet, um, he also told us a story in that interview about assaulting someone. Um, it was freshman year, uh, early in the year, and his roommate, um, had asked him to go sleep in his roommate's girlfriend's room because he wanted to, the roommate wanted to be alone with the girlfriend. And so, um, Austin who was feeling very anxious because he felt like everyone had more sexual experience than he did, um, goes into the room and um, she, was, uh, she was drunk and um, she said that she wasn't interested in doing anything. And, um, and yet he, get, he got in bed with her and um, started to touch her body. And, and then he stopped himself. Um, and he never labeled what he had done as an assault until later in that conversation with us when um, he was asked, well, what is sexual assault? And he said, well, it's when you touch someone sexually without their consent. And, and then he paused and his eyes welled up with tears and he was like, fuck me. Like he couldn't put together who he had become with what he had done. Um, and the big story, that, the, the big argument that we make in Sexual Citizens is that we need to reorient the conversation to think about what we can do to prevent things like that from happening. In 2014, when I began the project um, that ended up in, in this book, um, the conversation was really focused around adjudication. Um, the, you know, the idea was like, so much was wrong with adjudication and so much is wrong with that. And the, the focus in you know, the editorial pages and on TV was like, if we could just get that right, we would solve this problem. Um, uh, but uh, instead, we, we make three big arguments in the book. First, we need to think about prevention. Um, second, that's an everyone project. So campus sexual assault is not just a higher education problem, it's a social problem, and that means that institutions before college and outside of college um, need to get on board and do their part. Um, and then third, when we think about power, yes, gender inequality is fundamentally 
an element of understanding campus sexual assault, but there's so many other kinds of power. So you, you can't understand, you can't prevent sexual assault without thinking about racism, without thinking about socially organized inequalities faced by people who are gender nonconforming, without thinking about economic precarity. So we build on, on feminist analyses to look at how social advantage, advantage that men face intersects with other kinds of power disparities um, to present a much more comprehensive, much more challenging, but a much more comprehensive vision for what prevention needs to look like. And Seamus. <laughs> I, I mean, I think Jennifer really covered so much of it. I'll just maybe let you guys move forward with questions and hopefully it can kind of unfold. Absolutely. Um, so my next question then to you is, you know, reading the book really feels like pulling back the curtain, you know, not just on college sex, but you know, on life and in college in general. Um, it seems to be filled with up close and personal stories of dozens of students, especially of the student you mentioned just now, Jenna, Jennifer um, Austin. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your research and how you were able to give us such intimate portraits of what it's like to be a young person in college today? Yeah, um, so, uh, Sexual Citizens is part of a much larger project, which Jennifer Code led with um, Claude Ann Mellons called the Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation or SHIFT. And that project combined a range of methods. We, um, uh, Claude led a quantitative team that did a survey of 2,500 students. We had a response rate of you know, 66%. So we had data on 1,600 students, over 1,600 students and their experiences it included a quantitative diary that followed students over time. And then the ethnographic portion that Jennifer and I led together um, that did interviews. Um, so interviewed 151 students. Um, we sat down with them and talked to them about their lives before college, their experiences with drugs and alcohol and sex and their families, their experiences in college, then their sexual experiences and their experiences with sexual assault. And, you know, some of those interviews, there were so many stories that young people had to tell, so many stories of assault that they had to tell, that for some of them, for 25 of the students, we did follow-up interviews, up to three rounds of interviews. So we spent six hours with them gathering their stories. We also did focus groups with, you know, 17 different focus groups, some of just students in general, and then some of, you know, students of color, religious students, LGBTQ students, um, uh, women identifying students, so different kinds of groups to see how they talked about um, their sexual experiences. And then in addition to these interviews and focus groups discussions, we wanted to put this in conversation with the actual lived experience of being in college. And so part of the ethnography was participant observation. And what that means is that Jennifer and I, along with a crew of people that we hired, five people that we hired, spent time with students as they navigated their day-to-day -day lives. We spent time in having meals with them, so in the dining hall, at sporting events. Jennifer and I limited our observations to what students would consider sort of broadly public spaces. And then the people that we hired, who were much younger than we are, much more able to be out at one in the morning um, than Jennifer. I mean, if Jennifer and I are like, if it's three in the morning and we're up, it's because we just woke up, not because <laughs> we stayed up. Um, and so these other researchers were with students at other parts in time in their life. And it was, you know, there also weren't faculty members, so it was probably a, less, a little less creepy for them. And this allowed us to see students in religious student spaces, in dorm rooms where they were cooking dinner together, in fraternity basements, on intramural sports teams. And the aim is to provide a really holistic picture of what it's like to be a college student today. In particular, what it's like to be a college student at Columbia um, University and Barnard College. But the aim is to look at young people as whole people. So, you know, what's a little bit different from our book is that um, as much as there's a big push among activist communities 
to talk about how rape isn't sex. And we don't disagree with that. We also think that it's very difficult to understand sexual assault without understanding the organization of sex and sexuality on college campus. And so we wanted to figure out, like, not to study sexual assault in isolation, but to explain how it's a predictable part of the lives of students, a predictable part of the way that we have organized our communities and the way in which youth are experiencing their lives. And saying that it's a predictable part seems really troubling, but it has this hopeful Im implication. And the hopeful implication is that we can make sexual assault less likely for people through prevention work. And so, you know, the kind of final thing I'll say here, and I'm sure Jennifer will want to jump in after this, is that so much of the conversation about sexual assault is based in fear. And we take the position that a fear-based approach to sexuality, sexual expression, and any social problem isn't particularly effective. And so we write from a position of empathy and hope seeing students as whole, realized people, the kind of complexity of Austin's story that just Jennifer just told, and thinking, you know, the book has a lot of difficult stories that we tell of people being assaulted, but we do so not from the perspective of trying to scare the reader or the listener into feeling like this is a terrible, terrible problem, but instead to try and have compassionate understanding for young people and how they're experiencing their lives in order to provide a vision of prevention that we think could be effective. So, yeah, I mean, it is really, it is the most optimistic book you could ever read about, about sexual assault. Um, I, think, I think, you know, Seamus's phrase that we have, we have built a world in which this is a predictable outcome. The corollary of that is that we can build a different kind of world, right? By specifying the social roots of sexual assault, we can, undo those roots. If you think about driving, I'm like right in the middle of teaching my younger son to drive. And so I, I'm like viscerally experiencing what a horrible experience it is. But, um, you know, we've built a world where students, the young people um, can do what is a pretty dangerous behavior, which is driving um, without, mostly without hurting other people, right? And, and we don't do that by you know, turning our heads away as they grab the car keys when they're drunk and muttering under our breath, gosh, I you know, hope it goes well. I just don't wanna know anything about it. Um, and we also don't do it by only teaching them about stop signs. Like I could tell you, it is very important to teach young people about stop signs when they're driving, but you can't be a good driver if that's all you know about. And in the same way, like, the consent work that people are doing on campus is vitally important. People have to know about those stop signs, but people, you can, it's, it's like teaching calculus when people haven't had arithmetic to think that that is gonna get us to a world without sexual, sexual assault. And so, you know, the book really is um, in many ways a call out to parents and communities to do better before kids get to campus. If you think, about you know anything that parents do like think about oral hygiene and all of that like standing over little kids every day making sure they brush their teeth so like where is the attention to young people's emerging sexual selves what are all of the things that we could do to form people so that they will be better at sex and know how to do it without hurting other people thank you so much jennifer and jamie yeah, thank you for that. Um, so for my next question, well, as someone who early on uh, didn't have the chance to identify as what you refer to as a sexual citizen with my family, this book really spoke to me. Um, and at times it was hard to read. Um, I think it gives really important insight into the need to have these conversations with your family early on um, to allow everyone to be their most authentic selves. Um, and parents, as you mentioned, are an audience for this book, but um, who else do you want to reach with this book? Um, so immodestly, I would say everyone. I mean, when we say everyone has a role to play, we really mean everyone. Um, 
uh, but it, some of the writing really is for young people. Um, uh, I think that you know the young people who have responded to us about their experience of reading the book have said how seen they feel in the stories. Um, and we're hoping to lead them to use those stories for reflection um, about what they want to get out of sex. And also, um, I think, you know, fundamentally the work we need to do is to teach people not to assault other people. And so that means recognizing themselves as potential assaulters, not saying, and, it's, and in a way that's not about, am I a good person or a bad person, but do I have power that I'm not acknowledging that might lead me to inadvertently harm someone? Um, so uh, another story from the book, um, and this is sort of the paradigmatic story of, this is what everyone imagines. If they're not imagining someone jumping out from behind a bush, this is what they imagine when they imagine a campus sexual assault. Lucy was a freshman, um, first year. She was, uh, had been very sheltered in high school, had not had a lot of opportunities to um, be sexually intimate with other people. And she was excited. She wanted to lose her virginity. She wanted to meet some boys. And she and her friend Nancy went to a bar um, orientation week. Uh, some seniors started to pay attention to them. That was thrilling. The seniors bought them drinks. That felt very exciting. And um, so Scott invited Lucy back to the fraternity house with him. And she, this, it felt like the college experience that she had been looking for. And um, they stumbled up Amsterdam Avenue in the warm summer night. Eventually Nancy caught up with them because Nancy had had seen that had done that bystander intervention, and she was trying to keep track of her friend. But, um, but Nancy was pretty drunk, and so she passed out almost immediately after they got into the fraternity house, um, because you can't keep alcohol on the main floor. You're not supposed to have alcohol in the fraternity at all. But the response to that is not to not have it; it's to keep it upstairs. And so Scott invited Lucy upstairs um, to make her drink. And so they're on the second floor and then he invited her up to his bedroom and she went and um, they were making out and then he started to take off her pants and she said, no, don't. And he said, it's okay. And then he raped her. And so in that moment, in that awful moment of saying, it's okay, he was erasing her. He was not seeing her as a sexually self-determining person. He was seeing her as an object for him to accomplish whatever he wanted to sexually. Um, and, you know, Seamus and I, um, in some way, we're not judgy. Like, people should have, they should live their best lives in campus and out, right? Like, have whatever kind of sex you want, as long as you recognize that the people you're having sex with are people right? That's the kicker. And he was not seeing that. And so the one of the, the, we want, you know, most assaults are committed by men, right? And um, just uh, statistically, mostly they're white men. And so we want white men to read this book and to see their power and to see that they might use that power in ways that can be very harmful, not because they're necessarily bad people. I mean, both my sons are white men, but because, um, they're socially powerful in ways that can be silencing to their peers. And I think another group that we really want to speak to are policymakers. Um, and policymakers uh, who have, and you know, we, speaking to everyone here who's listening along, like thinking about how you can engage with policymakers. And sort of, there's a lot of ideas that we present in the book of, of what sets of policies we think are important, but a really prominent one is comprehensive sexuality education. And that is age appropriate sexuality education that, um, uh, uh, that, that addresses um, a wide range of things, but it's about how to treat other people, but also fundamentally thinking about sex ed as something that isn't a sexual diseases course or a sexual fear course, that isn't about all the problems with sex, the diseases you might get, the, the challenges of unwanted pregnancy, et cetera, but instead an education that says, you know, sex is gonna be a very important part of your life. It's gonna be a way in which you connect with people 
um, uh, that are really important to you, you need to think about what you want from that, as well as an education more generally in um, how it is that you treat other people. And I'm sure we'll spend a lot more time in this conversation talking about what that sex ed is. And there are good models for comprehensive sexuality education. Jennifer and I don't propose a new way of doing sex ed because there are a lot of great organizations out there that are already doing this work. And rather than you know, create competition in the landscape, I think it's valuable for us to lift up the work that so many other folks are doing. Um, uh, works like you guys. Uh, but the second thing is, is in working with pol policymakers to broaden the conversation about what prevention looks like. And one of the really big arguments that we make in the book is that um, sexual assault is about power, but, and gender and power matters. But there are lots of kinds of power on campus that aren't just gender and power. There's race, for example. There's class, there's sexuality, there's ability. Um, and we need to look at the multiple forms of power and think about them as sexual assault prevention. Um, so, you know, as an example of this, every single black woman that we spoke to, every single one told us a story of non unwanted, non-consensual sexualized touching. Now, that astonished us when we did the analysis. We talked to 16 black women and 16 out of 16 told us a story of unwanted sexualized touching. Now, that is a problem of racism. It is a problem of viewing Black women's corporeal autonomy as something that doesn't deserve respect, that, that Black people in general, their bodies are available to be touched and intervened in, in by whites because they don't deserve the full citizenship rights of sort of equivalent moral humanity. And so our vision here is one where equality is a sexual assault prevention strategy. The experience of those women is not just an experience of them being women, but building on sort of Crenshaw's work of an intersectional lens, it's an experience of both race and gender. And we do that not just in thinking about you know, black women and their experiences, but whiteness and how whiteness and heterosexuality and cis-heteronormativity like heteronormativity, all produce conditions of power. And so thinking about what are the ways in which we can do work with one another and with other organizations to build equity into the campus landscape and a view that equity as part of our prevention strategy is something that we need to push locally, but also push for policymakers by saying like, look, fighting for equality is one way to help address sexual assault on campus. And let's be clear, beyond campus as well, where some of the rates of sexual assault may be higher for women who are not in college than women who are in college. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. I love how you brought in this intersectional piece into this work. Um, because as what you know, survivors' experience of sexual assault is not a monolithic. Um, so we have to explore those different avenues for sure. My next question for, for you both is, um, you know, speaking more around um, the, the, the three big ideas um, that are centralized in the book, um, sexual citizenship, sexual projects, and sexual geographies. Um, through these lens, which, you know, these are the lens in which you would make sense of sexual assault, right? But what do you hope will be the big take home from reading this book? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, um, so, you know, the, the, the new language that we provide isn't just a new way of thinking about assault, but for understanding how sex fits into people's lives. So let's first just get the ideas out there and then we can kind of explain that a little bit more. The first is sexual projects. And sexual projects is the answer to the question, what is sex for? And it may seem like this is only the kind of idea, the question an academic could possibly ask, like what is sex for? But I want you to ask yourself that, like people listening around, like on right now, like what is sex for? And the answer is likely that sex is for lots of different things. Sex you know, it's for pleasure, 
but it's also for connecting with somebody who's important to us. It's something that we do often to give comfort to someone else. It's a way in which we sometimes discover our own identities. Within LGBTQ communities, sex is sometimes a project of identity formation and development. It can be ways that we you know, increase our status within a group or understand where we fit within the world. It's lots of different things. And the point that we wanna make is that um, in order to understand sexual assault, we need to understand what people are trying to do with their sexual lives. What are the projects that they're deploying? And there, aren't, there isn't just one sexual project, people have many. So sometimes people really want a relationship, other times they wanna just hook up. That can be the same person, right? It, it, there are multiple projects. And Jennifer said before, and I'll just reiterate, you know, most of the morality around sexuality is over projects. Like, what projects are good versus bad. Jennifer and I are not particularly moralistic about sexual projects. We're sort of like, you know, live your best life, you know, have this kind of sexual project that you want to have, but you need to recognize something about that sexual project, which is its implications for other people. And this is where the second idea comes in of sexual citizenship. Sexual citizenship is um, the idea that you have the right to say yes to sex and the right to say no. It's a pretty simple idea. It's that people have the right to sexual self-determination, but it's a pretty big provocation because part of the provocation is to say, we need to start thinking about a fundamental feature of people's right to self-determination as their sexual right to self-determination or the right to sexual self-determination. But there's a second part to sexual citizenship, which is that part of being a sexual citizen is recognizing that others have equivalent rights. So that you are not a sexual citizen unless you also recognize the equivalent rights in other people. And this is where Jennifer and I are moralistic. We do bring in a language of morality to sexuality. And that morality is a morality of how you treat other people. Do you treat them with fundamental respect and human dignity? And if you do, that is what being a sexual citizen is. People are not born citizens, they are made citizens. And part of our prevention work and our prevention strategy is to ask, how can we do the work to raise up young people and everyone into being sexual citizens? The final concept is sexual geographies. And this brings in a layer of space to the analysis. Yes, we mean literally things like furniture, but we mean so much more. So furniture, the example would be you know, imagine two young people, they're hanging out together and they wanna, they wanna go back somewhere private um, to college students. And so they go back to a dorm room. What is in that dorm room when they open the door? Well, there's a desk, a chair, a bureau, and a bed. And if they're gonna sit together, they've gotta sit on a bed. And the idea of geography, of a geographic or spatial analysis is that space isn't just the context within which things happen, it's an active player it actually produces future interaction. So like it or not, beds have social meaning. And if you're gonna sit on a bed with someone late at night, it sort of changes the nature of the interaction. And so we wanna think about how we could transform the spatial or organization of campus life and of our communities more generally in ways that might help with prevention. A critical aspect of space is power because one of the things that we know about space is that it's not equally distributed. Some people have more access to space, more control over space, more of a right to claim space than others. And so, you know, if you look at campus life, like let's go back to the story that Jennifer told about Scott and Lucy, space is a critical feature in the analysis that Jennifer gave us, that the fact that the fraternity and sorority rules mean that fraternities are allowed to serve alcohol and sororities aren't, it gives men control over the spaces where a lot of parties happen, where there's a Greek life on campus. And so men are responsible for the distribution of alcohol and the organization of party space. And it's not just men, it's typically wealthier, whiter men. And so that is a, a feature of campus life that's in, built into the design also the fact that they were upstairs, as Jennifer said. So these three concepts, sexual projects, what is sex for, 
what are pi people trying to do with their sexual lives? Sexual citizenship, the right to sexual autonomy and the recognition of equivalent rights in others. And then sexual geographies, how space is an important player in how people experience their sexual lives is the kind of analytic framework that we use. And it's one that we hope, you know, we use this framework to make sense of Columbia and Barnard, but we'd love to see other people use this framework to make sense of their own campuses and how things are different. So just uh, two things that I wanted to add on to what Seamus was, was saying um, in response to these like big take homes. Um, the way that we talk about power and sexual citizens, we, we really, like the whole point of education for students is to develop critical thinking skills, right? And so the argument about power is not an abstract one about other people. It's about yourself and how you fit into the social landscape in, so that, that young people can take, and I say young people, like I'm an old person, you know, everyone, take a minute to, you know, this conversation that we're having nationally about microaggressions right now, like everyone needs to take a moment where we are to consider how the social power that they have puts in a position, doesn't make them a bad person, but it enables them potentially to hurt other people. Um, if you think back to Scott, like, who knows if he was a bad person or a good person? Certainly, it's hard to think of him in that moment. Like, that was not, what he did was an awful thing. And I think the most charitable interpretation that we could make of, of that interaction is that he was unaware of his power. And he was unaware of how being in the third floor of a room, of a building where he was surrounded by his friends, um, you know, maybe 30 pounds heavier, three years older, how all of those things could have been immobilizing to Lucy so that when he said, it's okay, she literally could not respond because he shut her down. He didn't need to say anything to shut her down beyond it's okay because the situation shut her down. Um, so to, to, we really want people to reflect on their own power and then to think about sexual geographies as an invitation to to reimagine campus space um, you know so the big takeaways we can do better at prevention but not if our only focus is on campuses because it has to include the whole complicated lives that students live before they get to campus one of the um, papers that came out of the bigger survey project found that women who had had sex education before college that included training and how to say no to sex they didn't want to have. And that's not absent is only sex education. It's just sex education that includes some skill building. So those women were half as likely to be raped in college. That is for all you math people, a big effect size. That's about as effective as the flu, as the flu shot. So like basically we have a vaccine for sexual assault. It's not going to get us all the way there because sexual assault is not one thing, it's many things. And so we need many kinds of solutions. But one of the really big, powerful, effective programs that we have, we've decided as a nation is basically we're going to like keep it for rich people. And kids in poor school districts and kids in conservative school districts are not going to get it. So that's a policy choice in the same way that we've like chosen to become a global pariah around COVID-19, we're choosing to leave on the table these things that could, could be part of the solution to some of the problem that we face in relation to, to campus sexual assault. Um, I think another thing that I just want to like name before we move on is the importance of collective action. So all of you are here today. Um, to, to learn with NRAPE on campus and it's on us. And I just wanna really encourage you to affiliate. Um, so sign up with the NRAPE on campus listserv. Um, think about uh, it's on us campus chapter leadership. You can start by taking the pledge at it's on us.org. Um, we're, this is not a problem that we can solve as individuals. Our power lies in um, in collective action. And so I really want to invite you in to, to um, take this, take the next step in, in, in becoming part of that, of building that power. 
Uh, thank you both so much for all of that. Um, I want to say yes, please. We can never have enough people, so please, please come join us, um, and you'll start to receive all of our um, information if you are not already receiving it. Um, and building on both of your last points, um, I just wanted to say that I, I completely agree that it does have to be everyone's job, um, as I'm sure a lot of people, on, or probably everybody on this call does. Um, but I also really enjoyed reading about the suggestions and interventions that you proposed. And you've covered this um, a little bit already, but as part of Lucy's story, you did, you did mention that aspect of, of space. Um, would you mind building on your idea of sexual geographies and talk a little bit more about why you think that matters so much and um, especially how that provides a critical opportunity for the prevention piece? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, sort of gave the dorm room example and, um, you know, the implication of that is like, what would it look like to have spaces on campus that students could go to that were potentially intimate that weren't a room controlled by someone? But it also highlights policies, right? So um, there's just this naturalization often in, the, in, in how campuses work that older students get better stuff. And what that naturalization is, is like, a, like a reaffirming and in some ways amplifying power inequalities. So why is it that older students get better dorm room spaces? Um, and you know, what is the implication of that? One of the implications is that like, if, if you wanna be in a single with someone, chances are they are, you know, a senior and a junior are gonna have a better chance of having a single than a freshman or a sophomore. And so like, we've created dorm policies that literally funnel people into the rooms of older students. And older students aren't like bad people. Again, it's a return to that idea, but we are helping create contexts where they have the power and are in control. And they're already more powerful because they have more experience. You know, a difference in age of three years doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're 18 and with a 21 year old, it's actually kind of significant in a difference. So it begins to like open up that conversation about space, but it's also so much more. And I wanna tell just one, another story. And it's a story of charisma. And charisma was a woman, we spoke to her and she told us a story about being assaulted. She didn't really name it as an assault, um, but you know, her story began by basically describing Columbia as a white institution. And what she meant by that was you know, the party spaces on campus were run by men, white men, who liked to drink a lot. And she wasn't into the music that they listened to. She didn't drink as much. And as it turns out, like, if you look at national level statistics, whites drink significantly more than other ethnic and racial groups, particularly Black Americans and Asian Americans. That exists in colleges. It exists outside of colleges. And so, you know, the drinking practice in college is kind of, not exclusively, but kind of a practice of whiteness. And so parties that centered around the music that like the white guys running the frats were listening to and drinking as a main part of the socialization didn't really appeal to her. She also experienced those spaces as places where like the white men didn't find her attractive. And you know, this, what we know about dating patterns and race, isn't that surprising. And so what did she do? She found herself, um, you know, trying to find somebody else. And she met this guy through her roommate in Brooklyn. There's a long story about this. And the, the, you know, the short, the very abbreviated version of the story is it's like pouring rain. It's New York City. The subways aren't running. She manages to get to Brooklyn, you know, peel off her clothes because she's soaking wet. And this man rapes her. Um, she doesn't describe it that way, but um, uh, he puts his hands on her. She tries to remove them, and then he stops. Uh, he doesn't stop. He just continues, and she says, you know, body language had always been my plan A. I didn't want to have a plan B. But part of the reason that she didn't have a plan B was that she couldn't quite leave the space that she was in. It was really difficult for her. For so many students, like opening up their phone, clicking on a ride-sharing app, and being whisked away 
you know, was something that they could do instantaneously. But this is a $50 cab ride, right? It's not cheap to get from Brooklyn back to Morningside Heights. And, you know, she couldn't afford that. And so this helps us see how sort of class, but also race, experiencing campus as a racialized space where the spaces were controlled by white students primarily, by men primarily, drove her off campus into an era, into a context that was like riskier for her. And it's not just like, there's never a single cause to any of these stories, right? Like the whiteness of campus space didn't cause charisma to get rid of. The experience with this man and his refusing to hear her no and refusing to respond to her body language, those are very important parts of the story but so too is the spatial dimension of campus life about how wealthier students, men and white students often control high value social spaces. And that campus itself is, a, is, a, is this sort of racialized space. And so space is something that helps us all connect and recharge with people who share our identity. It's also a place where we connect with people we might have a sexual partnership with or some kind of sexual union with. There are places to be intimate. There are places to meet people across lines of difference in equally accessible places. And so what we would push all of you to think about, and this is going to be part of sort of where we move at the end of this session, is like, how are the spaces in your life organized? Who has control over them? What are the spaces that are accessible to different kinds of groups and how could that be part of a prevention strategy? This doesn't just mean thinking about like, oh, we need a queer student lounge. It means thinking much more broadly about campus as a sort of landscape of opportunity for challenging some of the power dynamics. And it also means, as we've said before, expanding the conversation to think about how new people might be brought in to sexual assault prevention. Jennifer and I, you know, um, uh, Jennifer in particular worked so much with a bunch of different people on campus. So this wasn't just a project of producing knowledge. It was a project of producing transformative knowledge and actually trying to bring forth that transformation. And one of our greatest allies in this project was a guy named Scott Wright. And I'm literally going to name check him because he was the head of facilities. And that meant like kind of responsible for space on campus. And we had built different advisory boards into this research. So we had an undergraduate advisory board of 20 students who we met with two hours every week on Monday morning from eight to 10. So shout out to them as well for like being so dedicated and they served as our kind of student entree into this. But then the institutional advisory board were deans and all kinds of people who were responsible for campus life, including Scott Wright. And as we started to present the findings, um, Scott Wright suddenly realized like, wow, I could be part of sexual assault prevention. And the way in which sexual assault prevention had been so siloed into say the Title IX office or the Women's Center or these different sort of local places on campus, the sexual violence response group, um, it, it sort of, you know, it was an attempt, to, he, he suddenly felt empowered or brought in to think I have control over space. And with my control over space, there are things that I can do to actually make sexual assault less likely. And one really small example of this was he realized when talk, hearing about the dorm room example that like he could keep one of the dining halls open for 24 hours on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. So that when students were at the bar and then they were like, well, there's nowhere else to go, he could actually have a space on campus for them to go to like eat fries, some of the places were a little bit like quieter and that, you know, it provided an opportunity for people to leave the bar or leave a party and not have to go back to the seniors single dorm room. Now, is that gonna change all of sexual assault on campus? No, absolutely not. But is it a way to think about how you could use available spaces on campus and think about who they're available to and who controls them? Yes, it is and it could prevent some. Absolutely. Thank you, Seamus and Jennifer, so much for, for this. Um, I do have one last question before I give you all some questions from our audience. Um, but I first want to say, again, thank you so much for writing this book 
particularly for me, um, just the three concepts themselves were um, ideas that are that I was able to add to my own kind of language toolbox when talking about this work. Um, some folks that I even just, you know, field partners we engage with, I, you know, start having conversations. I'm like, well, you know, we need to start talking about sexual citizenship and, you know, giving them the definition of what it is. And like, I've never really understood that's actually a great concept because we always talk about like body autonomy or, um, you know, self hyphen fill in the blank. Um, but it's a new way of, of understanding not only just self autonomy of your, of in one's understanding of what it means, but also understanding that other people have it as well. Um, so I want to thank you for that. Um, and my, my final question before we get into the questions from the attendees is like, what surprised you um, in doing this research? I mean, I think one thing that is surprising, is surprising in reading the book. Um, and I want to couch this by saying that, you know, we know there are people who weren't going to come in to be part of the research. So if you are a serial rapist, if you are someone who intentionally harms your peers, you're not going to sign up to be interviewed and study on sexual assault, right? So like there is a part of the story that we don't tell in the book. And I mean, that whole notion about campus as a hunting ground, like that is a story that is that has been told. And I think it's an important story. Um, it's not our emphasis. And so that's preamble to, I think, the thing in the book that is surprising, which is um, the voices of people who assault other people um, who thought they were having sex. So there is one uh, story that begins, um, in the book we call him Eddie, and he says, I put on a tie, so I knew I was going to have sex. And then he recounts this, that he didn't have, a, didn't have sex on while he was, didn't have a tie while he was having sex. But so he, he recounts um, being invited to a sorority formal, which he like wasn't super into the girl, but it was a high prestige sorority. And, um, you know, these kids are very achievement oriented. So, um, so he said yes. And he was, he's a competitive athlete. He was in season, so he wasn't drinking. Uh, she drank a lot. Um, and uh, he felt at the end of the night, he didn't really know what to do with her. Like he, he, he wanted to bring the evening to a close because he wanted to go to sleep. And um, he ended up bringing her back to his room because uh, it was pouring rain. And then he recounted to us, and this is so awful, he in his words, having sex with her as she went in and out of consciousness. And like, he, and, and he recounted it like as if he were the aggrieved party, as if he just like had to do this thing because she had invited him and he really wanted to go to sleep and the sex wasn't that good. And that was, um, you know, so like, I feel like in recounting the story, I feel angry at him, right? Like, how could you? And I think that that's for all, like for all of us here, that will be our hot take. And we also ask you to like step back and see that as a social failure, right? Like no one taught him to not like, I'm sure he got the training about people can't consent if they're intoxicated, but the ways that sex and alcohol are intertwined, particularly for wealthy white students, um, so that it's part of the social organization of sex for people to have drunk sex. Um, no one had, there were so many w things that produced that moment beyond his individual moral brokenness. And so I think it was, it was um, and that wasn't the only story of someone um, not, you could describe it almost as like not knowing how to sex right right? Like he did not know how to have sex in a way that was not harmful. And so seeing that, like really profoundly seeing that as a social failure um, is a big takeaway. Plus, I think those voices are just not represented. I mean, we tell a story about a woman assaulting her gay best friend um, in the book. Uh, so I think the stories of, of women assaulting men um, are, are rarely told. And so the in general, I think representing the perspective of the assaulter, not as a moral pariah, but as someone who hasn't been taught, um, someone who we have failed, 
uh, is, is a, I think, you know, it's a big takeaway from the book and I think something that people will find surprising. Absolutely, thank you. Before we get into um, questions from the audience, I, I also wanna share that we will take about, there's a, a, quite a number. Um, <laughs> so in order for us, just in terms of time, um, we'll probably get to about three, maybe four max, and then wrap up with our final question that will kind of lead into um, the kind of the next assignment um, that won't start necessarily today, but um, will be a part of our session two. Um, so I just want to put that all out there. Um, and I also want to acknowledge for those of you who are still with us, thank you so much. If you do have any other questions and we're not able to get to them at this time, please continue to send them to me and we will send to Jennifer and Seamus as well um, and follow up with you um, in our wrap up email. Um, but a question from the audience that I do have is from Michelle. Um, and they asked, what is the biggest piece of advice you can offer to those who have to educate and prevent higher education students without being preachy? Um, the biggest, I don't know. I mean, a big one is um, start with making space for them to figure out their sexual projects. I think if, if they, if students gained more clarity about what sex was for for them and had a greater understanding of other people's sexual citizenship. Like, I think it's, it's the ideas, like use these ideas to scaffold a discussion class or two discussion sessions. And I think also, um, if you're doing the education demand more time in the curriculum. This is not material that you can cover in a way that's transformational in 60 minutes. You need at least a couple of sessions and you need small enough groups that the work can be interactive because um, social and individual transformation is required to get there. This is not like a knowledge delivery thing. That's not our A game in public health. And so I think we want you to feel empowered to demand the, the, the structure that will enable you to really do the work effectively. I might add just two quick things here. Um, um, the first is that um, I think connecting the, sometimes the lessons of uh, sex ed are divorced from all the other lessons of kind of like moral education that people have. And so, you know, instead of sort of siloing sex ed as like, there's your sex life and then there's your, there's your life. You know, part of the point of talking about sexual projects is making a connection between the sex that you're trying to have it and the person that you wanna be in the world. And so, you know, connecting sex ed to all the other lessons that people have gotten, like, you know, don't grab, use your words. Like that is a sex ed, that is a sexual assault prevention strategy. and um, helping people see that and make those connections would be good. The second thing I'll say is um, just making connections to diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, that seeing, you know, all like, you know, basically partnering with other parts of organizations on campus and saying like, we need a generalized equality project. And that generalized equality project is gonna help address classism, racism, homophobia, ableism on campus, but it's also gonna help address sexual assault. And so figuring out how diversity, equity, and inclusion work can be tied to the sex ed that you're providing, I think can be really helpful. Thank you so much. Right, we'll look through more. Or Sylvia, if you wanna read off the question. And we're gonna try to be quick, give short answers. You can get through more questions. Um, yeah, we have um, a question from Alex. Um, thank you, Alex. What kind of interview and survey questions were asked and how did you create a survey slash interview environment that felt safe for students to share their experiences? So I'll quickly hit on some of these and Jennifer, you can fill in. For the survey, um, uh, we based the survey on other surveys that were had done before so that we could compare our results to other things. So the battery of questions that we used were modified versions of things that previous sexual assault researchers had done. We allowed students to take the survey either in their 
privacy of their own room or in a space on campus that we provided. And so people could choose either option and, and they did. For the interviews, it was very interesting. You know, we had an entire protocol of intervention, mental health intervention. So uh, Claude Mellons is a clinical psychiat psychologist and one of the people who co-led the, the project. And so we devised this entire thing about how to deal with students in crisis, you know, either during or after the interviews. And we didn't really have to use that protocol, somewhat surprising to us um, that, you know, that one of the things, Jennifer said, like, one of the things that surprised her or that surprised us during the process was how people who assaulted people often thought that they were having sex and described it as having sex. I think another thing that surprised us was how much the young people that we spoke to welcomed the opportunity to speak about some of these things because they felt like someone was finally listening to them. And some of that took a little bit of work to create a rapport with the student body, but some of it was also sort of, it in and of itself was an observation. Um, now we did a series of things with the interviews, which we detail extensively in the methodological appendix to the book. So if you're super interested in the methods, you know, there's like a 15 page methodological appendix where we talk about how we ask questions, what questions we asked, how we built rapport. But I have to say that the kind of silence and shame around sex that is so like pervasive, um, uh, both in sex ed, but then also in subsequent conversations, you know, we kind of unwittingly provided an opportunity to open up some conversations on campus that really weren't happening. And there were times where students left interviews where they were like, God, it was great to talk to someone. And we were distraught because of what they just revealed to us about their experiences. And so I think it was, it sort of spoke to the necessity of creating spaces for some of these conversations to have. And I'll note, we were exempt from mandatory reporting. So people could tell us these things. And we didn't have to report them. We got a legal exemption from mandatory reporting from the general counsel's office, which was essential for us to be able to do our research. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, go ahead. Can you... <laughs> we're both excited for these questions. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much for that. Um, we do have another question from uh, Valencia. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, um, but they asked, I am a Title IX coordinator and I am making my way through this great book. So far, I am motivated to use the lessons from the book to include questions about quote, what is sex for, end quote, in our prevention and other training presentations. The other takeaway is to engage parents more through information and capacity building. Other than incorporating sexual citizenship projects and geographies in our training and engaging parents, how else should a Title IX coordinator use the book to make their campus better? Um. A Title IX coordinator should use their power to call their state legislature and demand comprehensive sex education in their state. If, if you had kids showing up on your campus who couldn't add, you would hold the school system responsible. And I think that we need to see the um, sexual ignorance that so many people, so many young people have as socially produced. I mean, I, I recall one young man who was not from the United States, um, his horror at his girlfriend's lack of sex education. He, he recounted to us, he said, she said I could just pull out. And you know, in another moment in the interview, he, he said she didn't even know where her holes were. So like that is, we've done that to a generation, not we, Seamus and I, but like we America. And so I think that, you know, university administrators have some power. And so I would, I think, I, you know, I, we love to hear that you're reading the book and using it on your campus. And I think that it, we really want this to be a call to arms. Like every state has a set of local advocacy organizations that are working on policy change. And this is not only like a, a blue state thing, like, um, Sex sex, comprehensive sex education had been on the policy agenda in Kentucky, in Georgia, 
um, this this session until you know the world became a dumpster fire. But so use your power, ally with other Title IX officers in your state, and say like we can't keep these kids safe if you don't prepare them better to become sexual adults. That's amazing. Thanks so much. We did get into this a, a little bit, but I think it's a really great question, so I do want to ask it. Um, from Carolyn, we've got a question. Um, isn't the data on black men rapists not as available? If a black man, man rapes a black woman, it's far less likely to be reported. The women aren't supported by their community and they don't report. Um, it's not not a question, but um, I think it'd be great to talk a little bit about the reporting rates because I do think that that information is really important if you um, can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I'll just quickly tell um, uh, the question, I think it was Carolyn, I'm sorry if I missed the name, um, you know, it speaks to black men's experiences with um, assault and with also black women's experiences who are more likely to be sexual partners with black men. and. You know, I think you can't think about reporting statistics without thinking about experiences of race. We spoke to one man, his name is Carl in the book, and he told us this story of how, you know, he didn't really like to hook up because he was really concerned about the consequences of him of a false accusation, which he imagined to be way greater than it was other men. Well, just note that all men were really concerned about false accusations, concerned at like to a degree that was way more than actual rates of false accusation. But Carl met this white woman and he assessed that she wanted to go home with him and he assessed that she was too drunk and he like walked her around for a long time, like over an hour. She then finally pressured him to go back to their room. They went back to his room. He sat with her for another hour until he assessed that in his view, she was totally sober or sober enough to consent. And then he finally consented to sex. And afterwards he recorded her saying that she'd had a good time. And he told us that he'd done his research, that he, that he knew that New York was a one party consent state so that he could use that recording to be admissible in court in his defense. And this sort of speaks to the degree to which, you know, his concerns about a racialized justice system influenced his sexual practice. I'll also note that, you know, in the survey, we didn't find higher rates of unwanted sexualized touching for black women, but in the interviews, the stories came up all the time. The women didn't necessarily tell it as a story of assault, but they told it as part of a narrative of their experience. And so this is really the advantage of a multi-method approach where you know, through the quantitative stuff and the reporting rates, we get to sort of evaluate where we are compared to other kinds of things. But then in the qualitative part of the research, we get to sort of investigate, like, what are some of the underlying mechanisms or processes behind those statistics? And I think like the obsession over the rate, what is the rate, what is the rate, what is the rate? You know, there's so much work kind of showing, you know, the rates about one in four. It, it, and in some ways like, at this point in time, what we need to know is like why this is happening. You know, we've done so much work to show that it's happening. And then it requires, as the question suggests, breaking this problem down into many different problems because it is many different problems. It's not just a problem of gender and power. It's a problem of race and racialized relationships and how black women may feel more compelled to be quiet about experiences that they have with assault because accusing a black man of assault is to put him before a criminal justice system that they know may not treat him like in, in ways that are even close to fair. And that is a problem of racism and it puts some black women and, and women in general in a kind of horrible position. And this is what we mean by just talking about this as a gender problem or just thinking about sexual assault as one kind of thing that can be addressed by one kind of intervention is, is not likely to be successful. And the public health framework here that we use, which is to think about a multi-sectoral, multi-layered approach that has equity as its foundation is going to be the kind of thing that helps us get through the really important issues 
um, that are raised in this question. And, I, and can I add to that too a little bit, Seamus? Because I recently read an article where, or it was either an article or a book where, um, you know, sexual assault, particularly even in the slavery days, um, where uh, laws were actually written um, as like racial laws in terms of um, laws being more protective of white women. And, you know, back in those days, they didn't see um, sexual assault happening between slaves as, um, uh, you know, as something that shouldn't happen. They actually seen it as like, oh, well, that's, that's what they do. They're promiscuous. Um, um, you know, they're slaves. That's what they do. They're, they're animals, like the, all this type of kind of, um, you know, lack for humanity, um, if you will. Um, and being that, you know, if a black woman was raped by her um, slave owner, um, you know, it was something she didn't really talk about. Same thing as black men, they didn't talk about that either. Um, and so they developed this code of secrecy, if you will, which has then transformed and transcended over, you know, over time. And it's something that continues to happen within the black community. It's now seen as like a taboo, top, a taboo topic where we don't talk about what happens in our family. Um, which is, it's unfortunate, but something we definitely need to break the glass ceiling of, which I believe Tarana Burke has done a great job with the Me Too movement, but we need to do a lot more within that. So absolutely. Um, thank you. So I, because I jumped in there, I was going to ask a question, um, but I think I, I think we can, because we could do that a little bit of time. Um, and this will be the final question from our audience, and then Sylvia will transition us into um, the, the next phase of this. Um, this question is from Carolyn. Um, she, they state, I applaud you for saying that, quote, rape is not about sex, end quote, isn't sufficiently nuanced. I agree. But do you think it's honest when these men say they don't know that they were assaulting? When, wouldn't they know that it was assault if a man did it to them? Are we calling ignorance when it is actually willful refusal to acknowledge harm? Um, you know, I think that that's one of the, that's a very good question. And it's one of the limits of um, social science research. We can't know what's in people's hearts. And um, it's entirely possible that the people who told us those stories knew in some corner of themselves or just knew entirely and didn't want to admit it that they were causing harm. Um, the reason that we think it's a little bit unlikely is that um, sexual assault is very stigmatized in the campus environment. And so people know that it's bad. They don't want to be known as someone who's an assaulter um, there's a, uh, you know, people who are accused experience um, a pretty intense degree of social shunning for the most part. And so it seems unlikely to us that people who really thought that they, what they were doing was assault would come in and tell us their story. It doesn't mean that there are not those people out there. Um, and I think that really fundamentally, like, we can't know. But that moment that we experienced with Austin was so real where like he realized in that moment that what he had done and he was so wrecked by it. And I'm not saying that our sympathy should be that we should like center the assaulter suffering in our story, but we have to work on teaching assaulters not to hurt people. And so I think that we need to recognize with compassion their experience so that we can create a system that teaches them to do better. Um, so I think, you know, in some way, the answer to your question is like, it's unknowable what they were thinking. Um, and as public health people, the other thing that I would say is like, our focus is always on the broader environment and not, you know, what's in people's hearts or, you know, as I said in the beginning, you know, working one penis at a time. And so like thinking about our goal is, changing the social context. And so I'm not gonna say that it doesn't matter what they were thinking, but I think that in terms of where we're gonna have the most impact, it's changing the environment rather than focusing on 
um, these are people's individual moral brokenness. I think I'll just also quickly add that we do tell stories in the book of people who recognize that they committed assaults. And so there's an entire chapter on perspective of people who commit assaults. And the chapter is called Acts of Entitlement, Self-Absorption, and Violence. And so um, it's not that we think that everyone who commits assault doesn't know that they commit assault. Um, and we tell many stories of people who recognize that they assaulted someone. And, um, and then we try and make sense of why they did that. Um, and often our explanation is not that they were trying to harm someone. And again, this is like a methods thing, partially. It's that people who are trying to harm people probably aren't going to sit down with their sociology professor and talk about why they were trying to harm somebody. Um, uh, they're probably going to avoid us. Um, and so, you know, the aim of this book, we don't think that if like we instituted all of the lessons of sexual citizenship, sexual citizens, the book that like all of assault would go away. Um, we think a large portion of the kind of low hanging fruit of assault would be something that we could address. And so that low hanging fruit are the things that are preventable among people who don't want to be committing assaults, but do end up doing. Um, thanks so much for that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, gender-based violence is a pandemic and you really can't, you can't move towards a world where this does not exist without involving absolutely everyone, um, which includes all parties and having that uh, like community healing that you've talked about having. Um, because of time, I do want to move into our last and closing question, and then I'll pass it on to Kenyora, and we'll be sharing some of the next steps that we've talked about before. Um, but we do have a lot of students on this call, which I'm really excited about, um, and they might be thinking of this in terms of their school. Um, I am definitely wondering <laughs> what has Columbia done to, to combat sexual violence? And um, to build on that, how can we begin to engage in the practice of reimagining how our colleges are handling this and um, with respect to sexual geographies? So, you know, I hope everyone's sitting down when I say this. Um, most research has no impact on the world, right? You like, you produce knowledge, you send it out there and it gets ignored. And it was never, I mean, it, so from the beginning, we were like, we're not going to do that. And so the, the project was founded in what's called a community-based participatory research approach, where you engage the stakeholders who will use the knowledge from the beginning in a conversation about the horizon of the possible about what you're learning, about how you're learning it. Um, we were never going to hand Columbia a binder and say to them, do this, because it would end up in a shelf with all those other binders, right, about racial justice and, uh, you know, the, 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 all those ignored binders, right? We were not going there. And um, so, as Seamus mentioned, we had a board of um, undergraduates that work with us, but we also had a board of um, senior administrators from across the university who shaped the student experience. And so it turned out that the vice president of campus services, um, who's responsible for all housing and dining, grew to see himself as a sexual assault prevention stakeholder in a way that he had not. And so he made that change to the dining hall, but there were a number of other changes to um, how space was allocated on campus, not just um, in relation to sexual assault prevention, but in relation to diversity, equity, and inclusion, to helping all students feel at home. And so th this was really like, it was actually Scott responding to our research, which helped us see the power of leveraging space as a tool for prevention. Um, so Columbia, I mean, and, and we know, the other thing that I would just note is that we never started out to evaluate Columbia's prevention programs. Instead, 
we set out to reimagine pre prevention in general. So um, Columbia is doing a lot in terms of delivering prevention content. And I think that they're doing their best and across many campuses, typically that prevention programming is, you know, one or two sessions, some of it's online. It's not gonna change, it's not transformational. And so we, we had this sort of much more ambitious um, uh, hope, which is like, let's, not let's blow the whole thing up, but like, let's think of a totally, like, let's be more ambitious. Instead of preventing sexual assault, let's engage students across campuses in a conversation about sexual unkindness. I mean, there's some like hair raising stories in the book about sex that's not assault, but is just like a pretty shitty way that people treat each other. So this leads anyway, so the, the spatial part leads into the assignment, which is, and, and also the, the, the participatory research, like we, we want this conversation that we're having today to be the beginning of a conversation with all the students who are with us about what your campuses might look like. So thinking about the spaces for intimacy and thinking about the spaces to gather with people with whom you share an identity and thinking about programming spaces and thinking about party spaces and thinking about spaces where everyone feels welcome so that you can meet people who are not just like you, but who are different than you. Like thinking about the sexual geography of the campus, how would you reimagine it? What would you like it to look like? Um, and so now um, Kenyora is gonna, I think give, I think Kenyora is gonna give some explanation for, for like what that's actually gonna look like in terms of a, of a task. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer and Seamus. Um, and before we end, and I give you guys the, the instructions, I definitely want to say thank you again to both of you for your time, your expertise, um, and just the work that you've done, not only on Columbia and Barnyard, Barnard's campuses, but um, the work that you've done is definitely transformational for all campuses across our nation. And so um, I know that I will be sharing your work with other students across our nation um, to really just you know, have them continue to think about um, these fresh new concepts and how they can apply it into even their organizing work. Um, so as we get into the instruction piece, um, I also want to say that these instructions will be sent out via email. So do not think that you have to <laughs> remember everything that I'm saying here. Um, but as Jennifer and Seamus mentioned, um, and this is one of the parts that I, I love as someone who's done uh, community-based participatory research, um, this is kind of where the community comes in, right? Um, and so here's where you can be a part of reimagining your campus. So whether you like to draw, whether you like to paint, whether you want to create a video, or maybe you want a PowerPoint presentation, we really just want to see from you what your reimagined campus looks like in terms of sexual geographies. So you can submit your visual to info at nrapeoncampus.org. And during next week's session, what we'll do is we'll showcase each submission into kind of like a gallery-like art show or um, a science fair, if you will, but more virtually. Um, and each person who submitted their reimagined campus will essentially be able to share out their visual. Um, kind of like a show and tell, like we did in elementary school. So again, if you're an artist that likes to draw, paint, you know, we have a template that you can use just to kind of get you started. Um, and you can print it out, and, or you can even use it digitally, however you, you like. Um, or if there's a video that you want to create, we also have like a cover template that you can utilize as part of that video. Um, so we have a template for that. And again, like I, like I mentioned, if you like to do presentations, we also have like a, a slideshow. And we'll ask that you only use two to three slides maximum <laughs> to do this, um, but be as creative as possible, sky's the limit. Um, and um, I also, yeah, so that's it for the instructions. Again, we'll have this set for you in an email, um, but 
just so we know who would be able to participate, I'm gonna open the chat box really quickly. Um, and if you can just share out, yeah, hey, yeah, I'll participate or, you know, I'll send in a video. It could be a short video, two to three minutes. You don't have to do anything long. You can even do TikTok video, whatever you want to create that allows you to imagine what, reimagine what your campus would look like. Um, let us know. Um, but following this session, like I mentioned, we'll definitely send out the directions. Um, and we'll also have a recording of this session along with the other uh, sessions of this week by tomorrow. So we'll send a follow-up email with instructions today, and then we'll have a recorded, um, the recording of this session and other sessions of this week tomorrow. Um, but again, I just want to say how excited we are that you all were able to join us for today. Thank you for attending session one of Sexual Citizens, a landmark study on sex power and assault on campus with our faves, Jennifer and Seamus. A million thanks to both of you for this work and for every Thing you do and we look forward to seeing you in session two so don't forget to register <laughs> take care everyone <laughs> bye